Welcome to Biblical Genetics, Episode 7. I'm your host, Dr. C. I'm coming at you today from high atop Mount Lemmon near Tucson, Arizona. I've been doing some hiking up here. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. I'm uh, well over 8,000 feet in elevation. I'm uh, a little bit winded. I used to have a lot more air in my lungs than I do now, but I still love getting outside and getting in, in the beautiful air and the beautiful scenery. I came up here because on top of Mount Lemmon are two of the largest publicly accessible telescopes in the country, maybe even in the world. It's a great recreational place. It's a great place to come with your family at night to see the beautiful, beautiful, amazing stars here in the clear Arizona skies. But I want to use that as a bridge to my topic. See, telescopes, you look back. Well, in genetics, we get to look back also. And we used to look back a little bit, but now we can look back a whole lot more because this new thing called ancient DNA has come on the scene. So today's episode is about the mystery of ancient DNA. And I mean mystery, because first of all, it's not supposed to exist. There's not supposed to be ancient DNA. Ancient um, DNA breaks down so quickly, you're not ever, ever, ever going to expect to find DNA in something like a Neanderthal bone, unless it's not as old as they claim. Hmm. But we pulled ancient DNA out of mastodons and mammoths and ancient bisons and wolves and cave bears. And there's tons of DNA in the world and all these things that are extremely old. Imagine that. Just over the last couple of years, there's been a massive re-revolution in ancient DNA. I mean, it was a big enough coup d'etat when they first pulled the DNA out of a Neanderthal bone. But now they've realized that even if the skeleton doesn't have much DNA, the inner ear bone is extremely dense bone and it is packed with DNA for a lot longer than the DNA lasts in the rest of the skeleton. So now we're able to go back to these old skeletons we collected a long time ago and dig into the petrous bone and bam, DNA. So we've got DNA. We have thousands of ancient genomes. Europeans all over the place, uh, Asians all over the place, Africans. Um, I just read a paper about a whole bunch of ancient DNA from India. I mean, this is it's unbelievable how much data we have and it's reshaping all of our understanding of human history. The problem is ancient DNA is degraded. Human chromosomes are very long. In fact, your chromosome one's over a foot long. It's 250 million letters long. But when they found the first Neanderthal and they sequenced his genome, the biggest piece they found was on the order of about 50 letters. E. So they couldn't have even have assembled the, the Neanderthal genome unless they had a human genome to compare to. So what they did is they took the human genome and took all the random pieces of Neanderthal and they stuck it on the human genome. Said, oh, look at that. This is where the pieces fit. Actually worked very well because Neanderthal was human. Oh, so it didn't work at all with the chimpanzee. We talk, covered that last time. I'm sure we'll be talking about chimpanzee genome again in the future, but right now, Neanderthals. They're human. They're incredibly inbred. And they lived from Spain to Siberia, inbred, which means they never achieved a large population size. They lived in a very marginal environment, very hard place to live. There's actually a bit of an art to assembling an ancient genome. It's not nearly as easy as a modern genome when the, when the DNA is, is nice and robust and clear. Because while you're alive, your DNA is being attacked by oxygen and water and things like that. There's about a million, they're called lesions or mutations errors, mistakes, uh, oxidations of your DNA in every single cell of your body every single day. The reason you don't die is because you have elaborate and complex DNA repair enzymes that are constantly scanning and fixing your DNA. But when you die, those stop. And DNA breaks down very, very rapidly. And the same chemical reactions that happen in the ground with water and oxygen are the ones that happen in your cell. So when you find a, a, a piece of DNA from some ancient sample and you look at it, say, like, oh, there's an, a T there. <sighs> is that the original or is that something that happened chemically after it died? Hmm, it's hard to tell. But what we've realized is that the ends of the DNA molecule, so it's 50 letters-ish, you know, something like that, the ends tend to have more mutations than the middles. And so what they do is they scan it and they said, okay, up to about this point, we see a lot of this particular mutation. Let's just trim that off. Now in the middle, we can't be 100% certain that these mutations are original or happened after the thing died, but it's good enough. And that's basically what ancient DNA is good enough. You can't be 100% certain of the sequence, but you can be certain of what species it is, how closely related it is to other things, and we're able to tell a lot, a lot, a lot of human history from it. Let's talk about Europe. Lowest layers in Europe that we found DNA are Neanderthal. So Neanderthals live there. 
Later on, another group of people migrated in. It was a big debate for a long time. What happened? Well, the answer is they intermarried with the Neanderthals because those people picked up Neanderthal DNA. Not a lot of it, but they did pick up Neanderthal DNA. Uh, so that's the more indication Neanderthals are human. But those aren't Europeans. Another group of people moved in after that, and they did the same thing. They, they moved in, they had new technologies, different farming styles, different potteries and pots, and they mostly replaced the first population, but not 100%, and they interbred with them. In fact, the further north and west in Europe you go, the more likely you are to have one of those older DNA strains. And so here we go, Neanderthals are bleeding up into the population again, but those aren't Europeans either. Where in the world were the modern Europeans? Where are they hiding all this time? Well, it turns out if you go to Central Asia, you find a Kurgan. There's you know big grass mound that they buried a warlord in, maybe a horse in his chariot or something like that. And you look at the DNA of that individual, there's a good chance that he has very, very similar DNA to modern Europeans. You see, the Europeans weren't even in Europe yet. But the point is, there's a lot of art to ancient DNA. But we also have a lot of ancient DNA. Another big story. Oh, uh, yeah, I am at high altitude and it's a beautiful view. Another ancient DNA story. They were able to find a few, not many, but a few ancient DNA samples in Africa. Now, this is important because, you know, evolutionary stories in Africa and all that Africa stuff and like that. And Africa is a really critical place for DNA, but it's, a lot, it's not a good place for DNA to be preserved because it's so warm. You know, the equator cuts right across the middle of the continent. But they did find some ancient DNA samples. And when they looked at them, they realized that um, the DNA of the individual is not similar to the DNA of the people that are living there today. In fact, the DNA of the individuals across a wide swath of Africa is very similar to that of the people that are now living in the Kalahari Desert. This is the Khoisan peoples, the noble, wonderful people, um, the, the amazing languages that have the clicks in the middle of it, which I'm not even going to uh, try to interpret or even to, to, to mimic. I can't do it. But it looks like they got pushed out of where they used to live by something called the Bantu Expansion. Now, the Bantus, the most famous Bantu as far as Western Europeans are concerned, are the Zulus, because the British fought two wars with them. The Dutch, when they got there before that, had a lot of issues with Bantus, uh, with the Zulus, because you know what? They're like, hey, this is our land. What are you doing here? History. Oh, it's crazy. Anyway, the Zulus were, were the last group of people at the forefront of this Bantu expansion. And on the other side of them were the Khoisan. More or less. I'm, I'm generalizing here. People who know more than that, just forgive me. I'm trying to speak to the general audience. But when we look at the ancient DNA of the Bantu lands, those people aren't there today. It's as if they got pushed out. Happened in Europe, happened in Africa, what happened in North and South America when the Europeans discovered those places. It's happened in Asia when the Mongols swept through. I mean, this happened time and time and time again. So one thing ancient DNA has told us, human history is bloody. Ugh. It's also amazing. It's also fun to think about. And you know what? There's not a people group on this planet that doesn't have blood on their hands. We're all sinners. We're all struggling. And our ancestry, well, you know what? The reason we're here is because our ancestors won. Hate to say it that way, but that's just the way it is. So that's an introduction to ancient DNA. There's more coming. There's a lot more coming. Hope you enjoyed this. If you like biblical genetics, please subscribe to our podcast or our videos. Uh, you can go to biblicalgenetics.com and find some show notes for this episode and other episodes. And there's also ways you can help sponsor us because I can't do this without you. In fact, I'm already developing a wish list. I need a tripod. You can see this bouncy thing. That's because I'm holding this selfie stick in my hand. I need a dead cat. Yeah, dead cat is one of those microphones with the fuzzy things on it. Yeah, so I can put it here. And I need a fill light because I'm, I'm struggling here. I'm trying to stay out of the Arizona sun. But if I'm in the shade, that means there's bright background. What I need is a fill light I can put right here on my camera so I can fill my, my face. And in fact, that also means I can wear a hat. I appreciate your support tremendously. Thank you. Have a lovely week. I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.